So this morning, I wanted to start by asking a couple of questions. A couple of really, really simple questions. Um, we are going to have a little bit of interaction, but for this one, I need you to um, call out, and well, actually not call out, I'm going to ask you to stand, okay? So um, we're going to be looking at Acts in a minute, but I just want to do some simple questions to get us active this morning. So here we go. My question is, where were you born? Right, so if you were born in any part of Asia, can you stand up? Any part of Asia? Good stuff. Okay, you can sit down. If you were born in any part of Africa, can you stand up? This is great. Fantastic. Sit down. If you were born in any part of um, the South Pacific, we'll even include Australia. So if you're born in Australia, New Zealand, the Pacific Islands, anywhere like that, can you stand up? Oh, yeah. Most. Most. But not everybody. Sit down. If you were born in Europe, is anybody? Hey, we got a couple. Okay, that's good. Okay, sit down. Has anybody born in any place that I haven't mentioned? Canada. So, Canada. Oh, yes. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, will, I will acknowledge that Canada. If it was America, I might have said not so much fun. Uh, yeah, North America, that's good. And? Oh, <laughs> that's good. Okay, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Nobody born in the Middle East? I know that's, you know, just a, okay. No, that's good. Okay, so that's interesting. What about this one? Here, here's the question. Um, did you grow up in church? I'm not meaning like Samuel. Um, I'm, I'm meaning, did, did your parents take you to church? So if your parents took you to church when you were little, um, some of you are still quite little. Um, that's a compliment, by the way. That's not a dig. <laughs> Um, stand up. That, I said if you grew up in church. You know. Okay, sit down. So if when you were young, you didn't go to church, can you stand up? If you don't mind. Look at that. That's oh, just under half. Sit down. That's good. Okay, so that's an interesting one. How about this one? If this is for those that did go to church, okay, if you did spend a significant, t- uh, sorry, if you did, meaning if you did go to church, did you spend a significant time in a non-Baptist church? Now, what I'm meaning by that is, I'm not meaning when you go away on holiday or something like that. I'm meaning perhaps you spent five years at, at Elam or you went to a Catholic church or a Methodist church or something like that. If you, if you only have only ever been to Baptist churches, stand up. Wow. Okay, sit down. I'll I'll have to be sitting down. If you have been to um, other churches, can other churches at a significant time, can you stand up? Look at that. Look at that. That is a large number. Sit down. Now, The reason why I ask those questions is you just look around and see that you are individuals and you're different. We're all different. You know, we might have been born in different locations. We might have grown up in different churches. Um, We might not have grown up in churches, whatever the case may be. It's, and, but one of the problems I have is that when I wrote these questions, I, I was thinking that I actually need to apologize because I want to ask a question that I think is actually a stupid question. Here's my question, hopefully. Why do you come to church? Anybody going to be brave enough to yell out an answer for that one? Oh, it's a brave 
loud to worship the Creator was what was said. It's good. Fellowship with other Christians. Okay. If I'd ask it earlier, before some people had left, the queer, the answers may have been because Dad made me or Mum Mum made me come. It may have been because I wanted to get chocolate. Um, uh, but the reason why I wanted to apologize and say that I think that is actually a stupid question is because what actually is church? You know, this, this wonderful building that we have is not church. So when we say, why do you come to church? For many of us, for many people, they think, oh, okay, church is Sunday morning from this time to this time. Um, or other churches that might be in the evening. So we go to church. There is some truth in that, but not a universal truth. Because it's more important than that. You, we, are church. We are. And many of you would have heard stories, some of you have experienced. You go to different places, and they don't have the facilities that we have. Some places are meeting outside, some places are meeting in shacks, some places are meeting in homes, still church. Some places, dare I say it, don't meet on a Sunday morning. But it's still church. Because they are gathering together, they're gathering to worship God, they are joining together in fellowship with others. It's really important But there are some things that we regularly do that I think are important to do. Just like Jen led us this morning um, to hear stories about what's going on in people's lives, you know, wonderful story about the transformation of people journeying with other people. I have been speaking to a few people. They will, they know who I'm talking about. And one of the things that I really want to see, and I know others want to see this too, is when we come together, yes, 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 we're going to do it. We want to read from Scripture and hear what God is saying. But I want to celebrate with others what God is doing throughout the rest of the week. Because it's not just God appears on a Sunday morning from, from 10 to quarter past 11 or whatever it is. God is alive and active in people's lives throughout the rest of the week, and we can celebrate that. That's exciting. God is journeying with people. Even in grief, God is there. And all of that, all of this sort of introduction, is because I've been thinking about Acts and how much of we, how much of what we read in the Bible took place in the temple or the synagogue. Actually, when you read the Bible, there's not a lot that actually took place in the synagogue. Yes, Jesus went to the synagogue. Yes, the disciples were Jewish and they regularly attended. Yes, there were celebrations that they went to. But an awful lot of the Bible is about how we should live and encouraging people to live for their lives, not just two hours a week, whatever. This morning, I'm going to look at uh, two passages. Dare I say it, two sermons. However, a better word than a sermon, I would say, is two testimonies with explanations. One took place outside synagogue, temple, whatever, um, not in a service, and another took place in and around uh, the temple. So we're going to. I'm going to read quite a bit. Uh, and firstly, it's Peter's response to the people after the Holy Spirit had filled them at Pentecost. And then we're going to look at, continuing on from last week, Peter's response 
to people after he was involved in the healing of that lame man that we looked at yesterday. So really quickly, I'm just going to read from Acts 2, um, a few verses, 22 to 28. I don't think I put them up. I'll come back to that particular verse. But um, Acts 2, 22 to 28 goes, People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen. And his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of lawless Gentiles. You nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. King David said this about him. I see the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope. Very profound for today. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your holy one to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Acts 2.22, um, just one verse. I'm picking one verse out of each of these testimonies. Fellow Israelites, or another translation says, people of Israel, listen. God pu- publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. The second um, passage, which just took place after Peter was involved in healing of that lame man. We have these wonderful words. Um, Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. People of Israel, fellow Israelites, he said, what is so surprising about this and why stare at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power or godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all our ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate. Despite Pilate's decision to release him, you rejected this holy, righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed, and you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance, but God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah— that he must suffer these things. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord and he will again send you, Jesus, your appointed Messiah, for he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. Listen carefully to everything he tells you. Then Moses said, anyone who will not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from God's people. Starting with Samuel, every prophet spoke about what is happening today. You are the children of those prophets and you are included in the covenant God promised to your ancestors. For God said to Abraham, through your descendants, all the families, all the people on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant Jesus, he sent him first to you, people of Israel, to bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. Acts 2 I had those little bits that I wanted to look at. You know, fellow Israelites or people of Israel um, talks about these powerful miracles and these signs and wonders. And then we look at Acts 3, which is what 
we've just started. And the very first verse was, Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd, people of Israel. He said, what is so surprising about this? And why stare as though we had made this man walk by our own power or godliness? Again, we have this thing, people of Israel or family, friends, um, and we talk about this power or godliness uh, but Peter's saying it's not my power or godliness, it's God's, in the name of Jesus, that these things happen. But there's one word there that you can see that I've put in bold that didn't happen before, and that's opportunity. Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. The other thing we could have looked at, and it carries on, is um, in, into Acts 4. You know, and it talks about rulers and elders of our people. And the lame man was healed by the powerful name of Jesus. Now this passage, which I didn't read, because otherwise you'd just have me read, 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 is when the leaders, the, the, the rulers and elders at the temple, call Peter in and say, look, we've heard all the stuff. You're talking about Jesus. You know, what's going on here? And he, he then talks to them. So we have three little stories. Here they are. Hopefully you can follow me in this. Pentecost. Peter gets up, tells everybody what's happening. Peter um, and John heal the lame man. Well, God does. They heal in the name of Jesus. And then he says to everybody around, what's happening? Then, the third illustration, which is all very, very similar, is he talks to the, the elders and the leaders at the temple who are a bit worried about this, say, what's going on? And he again tells them what's happened. Oh, you, can you see that? Hopefully you can. Um, let me explain. As I was reading these three things, I thought, like I said previously, when you read the Bible, there is often, there's always something that we can take from it. But just because we read it, and it's written there, it doesn't mean that it's prescriptive. It doesn't mean that one thing happens, therefore I have to go and do it exactly that way. Okay? Let's, let's see a show of hands on this one. Who, who is a follower of Jesus became a Christian because they saw a miraculous healing? Put your hand up. No one put their hand up. Okay? But if I just read that one passage about the lame man and then all these people coming, is that how it's meant to be? No, but Peter used that. But we can see here a number of people who have committed followers of Jesus Empowered by the Holy Spirit, but that wasn't there. It's not saying that that's wrong, what happened in the Bible. Not at all. It's exciting. I hope to see more of that. But it's not prescriptive. It's not you have to see this. But when you see things happen over numerous examples, there is a, like a theory, an encouragement, but maybe there's a little bit more to it than this. We can see up here that we have these events that happened. The Pentecost, the healing of the lame man, and then the healing of the lame man and the people's response. Those are three events. Then the disciples' the response. In particular, we're talking about Peter here. Peter, after Pentecost, the power came upon him and the other disciples. He gets up and tells everybody about what's going on. And what does he tell people? He tells people to believe in Jesus, to repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. After the lame man, he tells everybody what happens. What does he tell them? He tells them about Jesus, and he calls them to repent. And he tells them to expect a time of refreshing. Okay, a little bit different, but very, very, there's some key things in there. And then we get to the elders and leaders of the church at that stage, well, cynical, um, temple, 
And they're saying, what, what should he do? You know, what's happening? Da, da, da. And again, he goes, well, you've asked me. I'm going to tell you. He takes the opportunity. He shares about Jesus, clearly stating that Jesus is the only way. Now, it doesn't say that he tells them to repent at that stage. So there's a little bit of difference. But the thing that stands out very, very clearly over those three examples is that he is given an opportunity and he takes it. He tells people, this is, this is what's happened, this is what's happened, this is what's happened. He takes the opportunity given to him. People respond, okay? And this is what I want to encourage you with. People respond. At Pentecost, people were amazed and believed. Okay? At the healing of the lame man, people were amazed and were baptized. But in the third example, they were amazed, but they commanded Peter to never again speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Peter turns to them and says, no, I follow God. You know, we are given opportunities, take them. But people's responses are not our, we can't control people's response. If somebody responds in a negative way, don't be upset about it. It's not your fault. <laughs> you know, if people respond in a positive way, celebrate. But it's not your fault. If I can use that word. It's all God in there. It's not about what you do. Except you get the opportunity. We get the opportunity to take it. Peter looked at something and goes, fellow Israelites, fellow Israelites, people of God, he knew who they were. He then turned and, and talked about the prophets and stuff. He knew that the people there knew what was going on too. But he asked them to repent, to turn away from disobedience and faith and to trust in Jesus. He wanted people to be restored into relationship. He also talked about them being the children of the prophets, heirs. And then he reminded that there is this beautiful promise that they are going to be a blessing to others. Participation in God's covenant blessing is actually tied in with this conversion. The miracle that happened is not what gives identity to the people. It is faith in Jesus. Jesus, Jesus took many opportunities to turn everyday events into spiritual conversations or events. You know, we could mention about the woman at the well, just the farming illustrations that he gave. You know, sometimes they're right in front of our face, the opportunities that we have. Let me tell you a story. In 1864, quite a long time ago, a gentleman arrived in Hawaii. Um, there we go, North American story. I need to apologize for <laughs> the dig about North America before. Um, a gentleman ar arrived in Hawaii to serve as a priest. Uh, he had felt a call to ministry, but the people when he applied originally thought, nah, you're not that clever. <laughs> um, we don't know if you can do it. 
Obviously, the standards have dropped now, because if you've got people like me. But um, he, uh, he, he managed to get through. They said yes, da-da-da. His brother was meant to, meant to go to Hawaii, and his brother got sick, and so he said, can I go instead? And they went, yes, okay. So they sent him to Hawaii. So he was to serve as a priest in Hawaii. Not long after he'd been in Hawaii, um, he came across a situation that was happening at that time. What had happened is people with leprosy had been sent to a, another island. And one of the bishops there thought about it and said it would be really good to serve the people on this island that had leprosy. But it was a very dangerous situation, they thought. They were not going to order anybody to go. So they offered it and said, would anyone um, volunteer to serve on this island? Well, he, he put his hand up. And four priests put their hand up. The original intention was that they would go on a rotation. So go for a period of time, then the next person, then the next person, then the next person. So on the 10th of May, 1873, the first volunteer, Father Damien, arrived at the isolated settlement uh, where there were about 600 people with leprosy. He was presented by, by the bishop. At his arrival, he spoke to the assembled people as one who would be a father to you and who loves you as much, sorry, loves you so much that he does not hesitate to become one of you. He loves you so much, does not hesitate to become one of you. Who does that remind us of? To live and die with you. So Father Damien worked in Hawaii for 16 years, providing comfort to to the people, and I won't pronounce the name because I'll get it wrong. Um, In addition to giving the people faith, He built homes for them, and he treated them with his medical expertise, which was limited, but he was learning. He prayed at the cemetery of the deceased, and he also comforted the dying at their bedsides. In December 1884, so let me say that again, he arrived on the island in 1873, and in December 1884, while he was preparing to bathe Damien inadvertently put his foot into scalding water, causing his skin to blister. He felt nothing and realized that he had contracted leprosy after working in the colony for 11 years. 11 years, this rotation thing didn't really work. He decided he would stay. And and the fact that he had this injury, um, didn't notice until he saw it, was a common way for people to discover that they had leprosy at that time. Despite his illness, Damien worked even harder. With an arm in a sling and a foot in bandages and with his leg dragging, Damien knew that his death was near. He was bedridden on the 23rd of March, 1889, and on the 30th of March, he made a general confession. Damien died of leprosy at 8 a.m. on the 15th of April, 1889, at age of 49. Taking opportunities is not always nice. But the success is amazing. The island was a mess. It was meant to be, oh, we just provide stuff. They can look after themselves. It'll be okay. Sort of put them out of sight, out of mind. He turned up, saw them as people, lived, cared for, celebrated did the celebrations in the morning, lived what he believed, and died with them as one of them. I don't know what he preached. I don't have any, I have never read a message from Father Damien saying, da 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 da, you know. But his life is one of the greatest testimonies. I am confident, I'm confident that he would have told people, look, you need to repent.
But he would have also said that God loves you. That's why he provided Jesus. There is no salvation in anyone else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. So from those stories, I was thinking that what can I take? Miraculous events do happen. Not all the time. Not all the time. But you can expect that they will happen. There are opportunities for us to share what little we have. Take it. But the thing I haven't mentioned, but you can see from the story in Father Damien, and hopefully you've heard a little bit from what Peter said, is we need to make it relatable. Father Damien was able to relate, clearly relate to the people he served, because he himself had leprosy. Peter was able to relate to the people around him, because he himself was a Jew, and he wanted his brothers and sisters, to know who Christ was. Now, I'm not saying you have to be the same as everybody else. Okay? Maybe relatable that you like the same things. You like cars. You like gardening. You know? Sometimes it's a lot easier than, than we give it credit for. But the one that I struggle with, and I think I can talk for a lot of us, is to share things boldly, to believe it will make a difference. Okay? It's not you. It's not you. It's what you share because Christ will use it. Expect it. Take it. Make it. Believe it. Okay? Let me pray. Father, sometimes we don't expect it. And I know often I don't take it. And I struggle sometimes to believe it. But I hear these stories, I hear your word, I see, I hear, I know that you are alive and active and working in this world, calling people to you. And it may even be today that for somebody, it is an opportunity to share or it is an opportunity to respond to what they have heard, what you have spoken, and please let it be. Amen.